Book One, Chapter Three, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Three. The Connoisseur of Kisses. Part One of Two. From his undergraduate days, as editor of the Harvard Crimson, Richard Carable had desired to write. But as a senior he had picked up the glorified illusion that certain men were set aside for service, and, going into the world, were to accomplish a vague yearnful something which would react either in eternal reward or, at the least, in the personal satisfaction of having striven for the greatest good of the greatest number. This spirit has long rocked the colleges in America. It begins, as a rule, during the immaturities and facile impressions of freshman year, sometimes back in preparatory school. Prosperous apostles known for their emotional acting go the rounds of the universities, and, by frightening the amiable sheep and dulling the quickening of interest and intellectual curiosity which is the purpose of all education, distill a mysterious conviction of sin, harking back to childhood crimes and to the ever-present menace of women. To these lectures go the wicked youths to cheer and joke, and the timid to swallow the tasty pills, which would be harmless if administered to farmers' wives and pious drug clerks, but a rather dangerous medicine for these future leaders of men. This octopus was strong enough to wind a sinuous tentacle about Richard Caramel. The year after his graduation it called him into the slums of New York to muck about with bewildered Italians as secretary to an alien young men's rescue association. He labored at it over a year, before the monotony began to weary him. The aliens kept coming inexhaustibly, Italians, Poles, Scandinavians, Czechs, Armenians, with the same wrongs, the same exceptionally ugly faces, and very much the same smells, though he fancied that these grew more profuse and diverse as the months passed. His eventual conclusions about the expediency of service were vague, but concerning his own relation to it, they were abrupt and decisive. Any amiable young man, his head ringing with the latest crusade, could accomplish as much as he could with the debris of Europe, and it was time for him to write. He had been living in a downtown YMCA, but when he quit the task of making sow ear purses out of sow's ears, he moved uptown and went to work immediately as a reporter for the Sun. He kept at this for a year, doing desultory writing on the side, with little success, and then one day an infelicitous incident peremptorily closed his newspaper career. On a February afternoon he was assigned to report a parade of Squadron A. Snow threatening, he went to sleep instead before a hot fire, and when he woke up did a smooth column about the muffled beats of the horse's hooves in the snow. This he handed in. Next morning a marked copy of the paper was sent down to the city editor with a scrawled note, Fire the man who wrote this. It seemed that Squadron A had also seen the snow threatening, and had postponed the parade until another day. A week later he had begun The Demon Lover. In January, the Monday of the months, Richard Caramel's nose was blue constantly, a sardonic blue, vaguely suggestive of the flames licking around a sinner. His book was nearly ready, and as it grew in completeness it seemed to grow also in its demands, sapping him, overpowering him until he walked haggard and conquered in its shadow. Not only to Anthony and Maury did he pour out his hopes and boasts and indecisions, but to anyone who could be prevailed upon to listen. He called on polite but bewildered publishers, he discussed it with his casual vis-a-vis -vis at the Harvard Club, it was even claimed by Anthony that he had been discovered, one Sunday night, debating the transposition of Chapter 2 with a literary ticket collector in the chill and dismal recesses of a Harlem subway station and latest among his confidants was Mrs. Gilbert, who sat with him by the hour and alternated between bilphism and literature in an intense crossfire. Shakespeare was a bilphist, she assured him through a fixed smile. Oh yes, he was a bilphist, it's been proved. At this Dick would look a bit blank. If you've read Hamlet you can't help but see. Well, he lived in a more credulous age, a more religious age. But she demanded the whole loaf. Oh, yes, but you see, Bilphism isn't a religion. It's the science of all religions. She smiled defiantly at him. This was the bon mot of her belief. 
there was something in the arrangement of words which grasped her mind so definitely that the statement became superior to any obligation to define itself. It is not unlikely that she would have accepted any idea encased in this radiant formula, which was perhaps not a formula, it was the reductio ad absurdum of all formulas. Then, eventually, but gorgeously, would come Dick's turn. You've heard of the new poetry movement. You haven't? Well, it's a lot of young poets that are breaking away from the old forms and doing a lot of good. Well, what I was going to say was that my book is going to start a new prose movement, a sort of renaissance. I'm sure it will, beamed Mrs. Gilbert. I'm sure it will. I went to Jenny Martin last Tuesday, the palmist, you know, that everyone's mad about. I told her my nephew was engaged upon a work, and she said she knew I'd be glad to hear that his success would be extraordinary. But she'd never seen you or known anything about you, not even your name. Having made the proper noises to express his amazement at this astounding phenomenon, Dick waved her theme by him as though he were an arbitrary traffic policeman, and, so to speak, beckoned forward his own traffic. I'm absorbed, Aunt Catherine, he assured her. I really am. All my friends are joshing me. Oh, I see the humor in it, and I don't care. I think a person ought to be able to take joshing. But I've got a sort of conviction, he concluded gloomily. You're an ancient soul, I always say. Maybe I am. Dick had reached the stage where he no longer fought, but submitted. He must be an ancient soul, he fancied grotesquely, so old as to be absolutely rotten. However, the reiteration of the phrase still somewhat embarrassed him, and sent uncomfortable shivers up his back. He changed the subject. Where is my distinguished cousin Gloria? She's on the go somewhere, with someone. Dick paused, considered, and then, screwing up his face into what was evidently begun as a smile, but ended as a terrifying frown, delivered a comment. I think my friend Anthony Patch is in love with her. Mrs. Gilbert started, beamed a half-second too late, and breathed her, Really? in the tone of a detective play-whisper. I think so, corrected Dick gravely. She's the first girl I've ever seen him with so much. Well, of course, said Mrs. Gilbert, with meticulous carelessness. Gloria never makes me her confidant. She's very secretive. Between you and me, she bent forward cautiously, obviously determined that only heaven and her nephew should share her confession. Between you and me, I'd like to see her settle down. Dick arose and paced the floor earnestly a small, active, already rotund young man, his hands thrust unnaturally into his bulging pockets. I'm not claiming I'm right, mind you, he assured the infinitely of the hotel, steel engraving, which smirked respectably back at him. I'm saying nothing that I'd want Gloria to know, but I think Mad Anthony is interested, tremendously so. He talks about her constantly. In anyone else that'd be a bad sign. Gloria is a very young soul, began Mrs. Gilbert eagerly, but her nephew interrupted with a hurried sentence. Gloria'd be a very young nut not to marry him. He stopped and faced her, his expression a battle map of lines and dimples, squeezed and strained to its ultimate show of intensity, this as if to make up by his sincerity for any indiscretion in his words. Gloria's a wild one, Aunt Catherine. She's uncontrollable. How she's done it, I don't know, but lately she's picked up a lot of the funniest friends. She doesn't seem to care. And the men she used to go with around New York were— He paused for breath. Yes, 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 interjected Mrs. Gilbert, with an anemic attempt to hide the immense interest with which she listened. Well, continued Richard Caramel gravely, there it is. I mean that the men she went with and the people she went with used to be first-rate. Now they aren't. Mrs. Gilbert blinked very fast. Her bosom trembled, inflated, remained so for an instant and with the exhalation her words flowed out in a torrent. She knew, she cried in a whisper, oh yes, mothers see these things, but what could she do? He knew Gloria. He'd seen enough of Gloria to know how hopeless it was to try to deal with her. Gloria had been so spoiled, in a rather complete and unusual way. She had been suckled until she was three, for instance, when she could probably have chewed sticks. Perhaps, one never knew, it was this that had given her that health and hardiness to her whole personality. And then, ever since she was twelve years old, she'd had boys about her so thick, oh, so thick one couldn't move. At sixteen she began going to dances at preparatory schools, and then came the colleges, and everywhere she went, boys, boys, boys. At first, oh, until she was eighteen, 
There had been so many that it never seemed one any more than the others, but then she began to single them out. She knew there had been a string of affairs spread over about three years, perhaps a dozen of them altogether. Sometimes the men were undergraduates, sometimes just out of college. They lasted on an average of several months each, with short attractions in between. Once or twice they had endured longer, and her mother had hoped she would be engaged, but always a new one came, a new one. The men? Oh, she made them miserable, literally. There was only one who had kept any sort of dignity, and he had been a mere child, young Carter Kirby of Kansas City, who was so conceited anyway that he just sailed out on his vanity one afternoon and left for Europe next day with his father. The others had been wretched. They never seemed to know when she was tired of them, and Gloria had seldom been deliberately unkind. They would keep phoning, writing letters to her, trying to see her, making long trips after her around the country. Some of them had confided in Mrs. Gilbert, told her with tears in their eyes that they would never get over Gloria. At least two of them had since married, though. But Gloria, it seemed, struck to kill. To this day Mr. Carstairs called up once a week and sent her flowers which she no longer bothered to refuse. Several times, twice at least, Mrs. Gilbert knew it had gone as far as a private engagement, with Tudor Baird and that Holcomb boy at Pasadena. She was sure it had, because— this must go no further. She had come in unexpected, and found Gloria acting, well, very much engaged indeed. She had not spoken to her daughter, of course. She had had a certain sense of delicacy, and, besides, each time she had expected an announcement in a few weeks. But the announcement never came. Instead, a new man came. Scenes! Young men walking up and down the library like caged tigers, young men glaring at each other in the hall as one came and the other left, young men calling up on the telephone and being hung up upon in desperation, young men threatening South America, young men writing the most pathetic letters. She said nothing to this effect, but Dick fancied that Mrs. Gilbert's eyes had seen some of these letters. And Gloria, between tears and laughter, sorry, glad, out of love and in love, miserable, nervous, cool, amidst a great returning of presents, substitution of pictures and immemorial frames, and taking of hot baths, and beginning again, with the next. That state of things continued, assumed an air of permanency. Nothing harmed Gloria or changed her or moved her. And then, out of a clear sky one day, she informed her mother that undergraduates wearied her. She was absolutely going to no more college dances. This had begun the change, not so much in her actual habits, for she danced, and had as many dates as ever, but they were dates in a different spirit. Previously it had been a sort of pride, a matter of her own vainglory. She had been, probably, the most celebrated and sought-after young beauty in the country, Gloria Gilbert of Kansas City. She had fed on it ruthlessly, enjoying the crowds around her, the manner in which the most desirable men singled her out, enjoying the fierce jealousy of other girls, enjoying the fabulous, not to say scandalous, and, her mother was glad to say, entirely unfounded rumors about her. For instance, that she had gone in the Yale swimming pool one night in a chiffon evening dress. And from loving it with a vanity that was almost masculine, it had been in the nature of a triumphant and dazzling career. She became suddenly an aesthetic to it. She retired. She who had dominated countless parties, who had blown fragrantly through many ballrooms to the tender tribute of many eyes, seemed to care no longer. He who fell in love with her now was dismissed utterly, almost angrily. She went listlessly with the most indifferent men. She continually broke engagements, not as in the past from a cool assurance that she was irreproachable, that the men she insulted would return like a domestic animal, but indifferently, without contempt or pride. She rarely stormed at men any more. She yawned at them. She seemed, and it was so strange, she seemed to her mother to be growing cold. Richard Caramel listened. At first he had remained standing, but, as his aunt's discourse waxed in content, it stands here pruned by half, of all side references to the youth of Gloria's soul and to Mrs. Gilbert's own mental distresses, he drew a chair up and attended rigorously, as she floated, between tears and plaintive helplessness, down the long story of Gloria's life. When she came to the tale of this last year, a tale of the ends of cigarettes left all over New York in little trays marked Midnight Frolic, and Justine Johnson's little club. He began nodding his head slowly, then faster and faster, until, as she finished on a staccato note, it was bobbing briskly up and down, absurdly like a doll's wired head, 
of expressing almost anything. In a sense Gloria's past was an old story to him. He had followed it with the eyes of a journalist, for he was going to write a book about her some day. But his interests, just at present, were family interests. He wanted to know, in particular, who was this Joseph Blockman that he had seen her with several times, and those two girls she was with constantly, this Rachel Gerald and this Miss Kane. Surely Miss Kane wasn't exactly the sort one would associate with Gloria. But the moment had passed. Mrs. Gilbert, having climbed the hill of exposition, was about to glide swiftly down the ski-jump of collapse. Her eyes were like a blue sky seen through two round red window casements. The flesh about her mouth was trembling. And at the moment the door opened, admitting into the room Gloria and the two young ladies lately mentioned. Two young women. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Gilbert? Miss Kane and Miss Gerald are presented to Mr. Richard Caramel. This is Dick, laughter. I've heard so much about you, says Miss Kane, between a giggle and a shout. How do you do? says Miss Gerald shyly. Richard Caramel tries to move about as if his figure were better. He is torn between his innate cordiality and the fact that he considers these girls rather common, not at all the farm-over type. Gloria has disappeared into the bedroom. Do sit down, beams Mrs. Gilbert, who is by now quite herself. Take off your things. Dick is afraid she will make some remark about the age of his soul, but he forgets his qualms in completing a conscientious novelist's examination of the two young women. Muriel Kane had originated in a rising family of East Orange. She was short rather than small, and hovered audaciously between plumpness and width. Her hair was black and elaborately arranged. This, in conjunction with her handsome, rather bovine eyes and her over-red lips, combined to make her resemble Thedabara, the prominent motion-picture actress. People told her constantly that she was a vampire, and she believed them. She suspected, hopefully, that they were afraid of her, and she did her utmost under all circumstances to give the impression of danger. An imaginative man could see the red flag that she constantly carried, waving it wildly, beseechingly, and, alas, to little spectacular avail. She was also tremendously timely. She knew the latest songs, all the latest songs. When one of them was played on the phonograph, she would rise to her feet and rock her shoulders back and forth and snap her fingers, and if there was no music she would accompany herself by humming. Her conversation was also timely. I don't care, she would say. I should worry and lose my figure. And again, I can't make my feet behave when I hear that tune. Oh, baby! Her fingernails were too long and ornate, polished to a pink and unnatural fever. Her clothes were too tight, too stylish, too vivid, her eyes too roguish, her smile too coy. She was almost pitifully overemphasized from head to foot. The older girl was obviously a more subtle personality. She was an exquisitely dressed Jewess, with dark hair and a lovely milky pallor. She seemed shy and vague, and these two qualities accentuated a rather delicate charm that floated about her. Her family were Episcopalians, owned three smart women's shops along Fifth Avenue, and lived in a magnificent apartment on Riverside Drive. It seemed to Dick, after a few moments, that she was attempting to imitate Gloria. He wondered that people invariably chose inimitable people to imitate. "'We had the most hectic time!' Muriel was exclaiming enthusiastically. "'There was a crazy woman behind us on the bus. She was absolutely, positively nutty. She kept talking to herself about something she'd like to do to somebody or something, I was petrified, but Gloria simply wouldn't get off. Mrs. Gilbert opened her mouth, properly awed. Really? Oh, she was crazy, but we should worry. She didn't hurt us. Ugly. Gracious. The man across from us said her face ought to be on a night nurse in a home for the blind, and we all howled, naturally, so the man tried to pick us up. Presently Gloria emerged from her bedroom, and in unison every eye turned to her. The two girls receded into a shadowy background, unperceived, unmissed. "'We've been talking about you,' said Dick quickly, "'your mother and I.' "'Well,' said Gloria. A pause. Muriel turned to Dick. "'You're a great writer, aren't you?' "'I'm a writer,' he confessed sheepishly. "'I always say,' said Muriel earnestly, "'that if I ever had the time to write down all my experiences, "'it'd make a wonderful book.' Rachel giggled sympathetically. Richard Caramel's bow was almost stately. Muriel continued, But I don't see how you can sit down and do it, 
And poetry. Lordy, I can't make two lines rhyme. Well, I should worry. Richard Caramel, with difficulty, restrained a shout of laughter. Gloria was chewing an amazing gumdrop and staring moodily out the window. Mrs. Gilbert cleared her throat and beamed. But you see, she said, in a sort of universal exposition, you're not an ancient soul, like Richard. The ancient soul breathed a gasp of relief. It was out at last. Then, as if she had been considering it for five minutes, Gloria made a sudden announcement. I'm going to give a party. Oh, can I come? cried Muriel with facetious daring. A dinner. Seven people. Muriel and Rachel and I, and you, Dick and Anthony, and that man named Noble. I liked him. And Blockman. Muriel and Rachel went into soft and purring ecstasies of enthusiasm. Mrs. Gilbert blinked and beamed. With an air of casualness, Dick broke in with a question. Who is this fellow Blockman, Gloria? Scenting a faint hostility, Gloria turned to him. Joseph Blockman? He's the moving picture man, vice president of Films Par Excellence. He and father do a lot of business. Oh. Well, will you all come? They would all come. A date was arranged within the week. Dick rose, adjusted hat, coat, and muffler, and gave out a general smile. Bye-bye, said Muriel, waving her hand gaily. Call me up some time. Richard Caramel blushed for her. Deplorable End of the Chevalier O'Keefe It was Monday, and Anthony took Geraldine Burke to luncheon at the Beaux-Arts. Afterward they went up to his apartment, and he wheeled out the little rolling table that held his supply of liquor, selecting vermouth, gin, and absinthe for a proper stimulant. Geraldine Burke, usher at Keith's, had been an amusement of several months. She demanded so little that he liked her, for since a lamentable affair with a debutante the preceding summer, when he had discovered that after half a dozen kisses a proposal was expected, he had been wary of girls of his own class. It was only too easy to turn a critical eye on their imperfections, some physical harshness or a general lack of personal delicacy, but a girl who was usher at Keith's was approached with a different attitude. One could tolerate qualities in an intimate valet that would be unforgivable in a mere acquaintance on one social level. Geraldine, curled up at the foot of the lounge, considered him with narrow, slanting eyes. "'You drink all the time, don't you?' she said suddenly. "'Why, I suppose so,' replied Anthony, in some surprise. "'Don't you?' "'Nope. I go on parties sometimes, you know, about once a week, but I only take two or three drinks. You and your friends keep on drinking all the time. I should think you'd ruin your health.' Anthony was somewhat touched. "'Why, aren't you sweet to worry about me?' Well, I do. I don't drink so very much, he declared. Last month I didn't touch a drop for three weeks, and I only get really tight about once a week. But you have something to drink every day, and you're only twenty-five. Haven't you any ambition? Think what you'll be at forty. I sincerely trust that I won't live that long. She clicked her tongue with her teeth. You crazy, she said, as he mixed another cocktail, and then, Are you any relation to Adam Patch? Yes, he's my grandfather. Really? She was obviously thrilled. Absolutely. That's funny. My daddy used to work for him. He's a queer old man. Is he nice? She demanded. Well, in private life he's seldom unnecessarily disagreeable. Tell us about him. Why, Anthony considered, he's all shrunken up, and he's got the remains of some gray hair that always looks as though the wind were in it. He's very moral. He's done a lot of good, said Geraldine, with intense gravity. Rot, scoffed Anthony. He's a pious ass, a chicken brain. Her mind left the subject and flitted on. Why don't you live with him? Why don't I board in a Methodist parsonage? You crazy! Again she made a little clicking sound to express disapproval. Anthony thought how moral was this little waif at heart. How completely moral she would still be, after the inevitable wave came that would wash her off the sands of respectability. Do you hate him? I wonder. I never liked him. You never like people who do things for you. Does he hate you? My dear Geraldine, protested Anthony, frowning humorously, do have another cocktail. I annoy him. If I smoke a cigarette, he comes into the room sniffing. He's a prig, a bore, and something of a hypocrite. I probably wouldn't be telling you this if I hadn't had a few drinks, but I don't suppose it matters. 
Geraldine was persistently interested. She held her glass, untasted, between finger and thumb, and regarded him with eyes in which there was a touch of awe. "'How do you mean a hypocrite?' "'Well,' said Anthony impatiently, "'maybe he's not. But he doesn't like the things that I like, and so, as far as I'm concerned, he's uninteresting.' "'Hm.' Her curiosity seemed, at length, satisfied. She sank back into the sofa and sipped her cocktail. "'You're a funny one,' she commented thoughtfully. "'Does everybody want to marry you because your grandfather is rich?' "'They don't, but I shouldn't blame them if they did. Still, you see, I never intend to marry.' She scorned this. "'You'll fall in love some day. Oh, you will, I know.' She nodded wisely. "'It'd be idiotic to be overconfident. That's what ruined the Chevalier O'Keefe.' "'Who is he?' "'A creature of my splendid mind. He's my one creation, the Chevalier.' Crazy, she murmured pleasantly, using the clumsy rope ladder with which she bridged all gaps and climbed after her mental superiors. Subconsciously she felt that it eliminated distances and brought the person whose imagination had eluded her back within range. Oh, no, objected Anthony. Oh, no, Geraldine. You mustn't play the alienist upon the chevalier. If you feel yourself unable to understand him, I won't bring him in. Besides, I should feel a certain uneasiness because of his regrettable reputation. I guess I can understand anything that's got any sense to it, answered Geraldine a bit testily. In that case, there are various episodes in the life of the Chevalier which might prove diverting. Well? It was his untimely end that caused me to think of him and made him apropos in the conversation. I hate to introduce him end foremost, but it seems inevitable that the Chevalier must back into your life. Well, what about him? Did he die? He did, in this manner. He was an Irishman, Geraldine, a semi-fictional Irishman, the wild sort with a genteel brogue and reddish hair. He was exiled from Erin in the late days of chivalry, and, of course, crossed over to France. Now, the Chevalier O'Keefe, Geraldine, had, like me, one weakness. He was enormously susceptible to all sorts and conditions of women. Besides being a sentimentalist, he was a romantic, a vain fellow, a man of wild passions, a little blind in one eye and almost stone-blind in the other. Now a male roaming the world in this condition is as helpless as a lion without teeth, and in consequence the Chevalier was made utterly miserable for twenty years by a series of women who hated him, used him, bored him, aggravated him, sickened him, spent his money, made a fool of him, in brief, as the world has it, loved him. This was bad, Geraldine, and as the Chevalier save for this one weakness, this exceeding susceptibility, was a man of penetration, he decided that he would rescue himself once and for all from these drains upon him. With this purpose he went to a very famous monastery in Champagne called, well, anachronistically known as St. Voltaire's. It was the rule at St. Voltaire's that no monk could descend to the ground story of the monastery so long as he lived, but should exist engaged in prayer and contemplation in one of the four towers which were called after the four commandments of the monastery rule, poverty, chastity, obedience, and silence. When the day came that was to witness the Chevalier's farewell to the world, he was utterly happy. He gave all his Greek books to his landlady, and his sword he sent in a golden sheath to the King of France, and all his mementos of Ireland he gave to the young Huguenot who sold fish in the street where he lived. Then he rode out to St. Voltaire's, slew his horse at the door, and presented the carcass to the monastery cook. At five o'clock that night he felt, for the first time, free, forever free from sex. No woman could enter the monastery, no monk could descend below the second story. So as he climbed the winding stair that led to his cell at the very top of the Tower of Chastity, he paused for a moment by an open window which looked down fifty feet onto a road below. It was all so beautiful, he thought, this world that he was leaving the golden shower of sun beating down upon the long fields, the spray of trees in the distance, the vineyards, quiet and green, freshening wide miles before him. He leaned his elbows on the window casement and gazed at the winding road. Now, as it happened, Therese, a peasant girl of sixteen from a neighboring village, was at that moment passing along this same road that ran in front of the monastery. Five minutes before, the little piece of ribbon which held up the stocking on her pretty left leg had worn through and broken. Being a girl of rare modesty, she had thought to wait until she arrived home before repairing it, 
but it had bothered her to such an extent that she felt she could endure it no longer. So, as she passed the Tower of Chastity, she stopped and with a pretty gesture lifted her skirt, as little as possible, be it said to her credit, to adjust her garter. Up in the tower, the newest arrival in the ancient monastery of St. Voltaire, as though pulled forward by a gigantic and irresistible hand, leaned from the window. Further he leaned and further until suddenly one of the stones loosened under his weight, broke from its cement with a soft powdery sound, and, first headlong, then head over heels, finally, in a vast and impressive revolution, tumbled the Chevalier O'Keefe, bound for the hard earth and eternal damnation. Therese was so much upset by the occurrence that she ran all the way home, and for ten years spent an hour a day in secret prayer for the soul of the monk, whose neck and vows were simultaneously broken on that unfortunate Sunday afternoon. And the Chevalier O'Keefe, being suspected of suicide, was not buried in consecrated ground, but tumbled into a field nearby, where he doubtless improved the quality of the soil for many years afterward. Such was the untimely end of a very brave and gallant gentleman. What do you think, Geraldine? But Geraldine, lost long before, could only smile roguishly, wave her first finger at him, and repeat her bridge-all, her explain-all. Crazy, she said. You crazy! His thin face was kindly, she thought, and his eyes quite gentle. She liked him because he was arrogant without being conceited, and because, unlike the men she met about the theatre, he had a horror of being conspicuous. What an odd, pointless story! But she had enjoyed the part about the stocking. After the fifth cocktail he kissed her, and between laughter and bantering caresses and a half-stifled flare of passion they passed an hour. At four-thirty she claimed an engagement, and going into the bathroom she rearranged her hair. Refusing to let him order her a taxi, she stood for a moment in the doorway. "'You will get married,' she was insisting. "'You wait and see!' Anthony was playing with an ancient tennis ball, and he bounced it carefully on the floor several times before he answered with a soupçon of acidity. "'You're a little idiot, Geraldine.' She smiled provokingly. "'Oh, I am, am I? Want to bet?' "'That'd be silly, too.' "'Oh, it would, would it? Well, I'll just bet you'll marry somebody inside of a year.' Anthony bounced the tennis ball very hard. This was one of his handsome days, she thought. A sort of intensity had displaced the melancholy in his dark eyes. "'Geraldine,' he said at length, "'in the first place I have no one I want to marry. In the second place I haven't enough money to support two people. In the third place I am entirely opposed to marriage for people of my type. In the fourth place I have a strong distaste for even the abstract consideration of it.' But Geraldine only narrowed her eyes knowingly, made her clicking sound, and said she must be going. It was late. "'Call me up soon,' she reminded him as he kissed her goodbye. "'You have it for three weeks, you know.' "'I will.' he promised fervently. He shut the door, and coming back into the room, stood for a moment lost in thought with the tennis ball still clasped in his hand. There was one of his lonelinesses coming, one of those times when he walked the streets or sat, aimless and depressed, biting a pencil at his desk. It was a self-absorption with no comfort, a demand for expression with no outlet, a sense of time rushing by, ceaselessly and wastefully, assaged only by that conviction that there was nothing to waste, because all efforts and attainments were equally valueless. He thought with emotion, aloud, ejaculative, for he was hurt and confused. No idea of getting married, by God! Of a sudden he hurled the tennis ball violently across the room, where it barely missed the lamp, and, rebounding here and there for a moment, lay still upon the floor. Sunlight and Moonlight for her dinner, Gloria had taken a table in the Cascades at the Biltmore, and when the men met in the hall outside a little after eight, that person, Blockman, was the target of six masculine eyes. He was a stoutening, ruddy Jew of about thirty-five, with an expressive face under smooth sandy hair, and, no doubt, in most business gatherings his personality would have been considered ingratiating. He sauntered up to the three younger men, who stood in a group smoking as they waited for their hostess, and introduced himself with a little too evident assurance. Nevertheless, it is to be doubted whether he received the intended impression of faint and ironic chill. There was no hint of understanding in his manner. "'You related to Adam J. Patch?' he inquired of Anthony, emitting two slender strings of smoke from nostrils over wide. 
Anthony admitted it with the ghost of a smile. "'He's a fine man,' pronounced Blockman profoundly. "'He's a fine example of an American.' "'Yes,' agreed Anthony. "'He certainly is.' "'I detest these underdone men,' he thought coldly. "'Boiled looking. Ought to be shoved back in the oven. Just one more minute would do it.' Blockman squinted at his watch. "'Time these girls were showing up.' Anthony waited breathlessly. It came. But then, with a widening smile, you know how women are. The three young men nodded. Blockman looked casually about him, his eyes resting critically on the ceiling and then passing lower. His expression combined that of a Middle Western farmer appraising his wheat crop and that of an actor wondering whether he is observed, the public banner of all good Americans. As he finished his survey, he turned back quickly to the reticent trio, determined to strike to their very heart and core. "'You college men? Harvard, eh? I see the Princeton boys beat you fellows in hockey.' Unfortunate man. He had drawn another blank. They had been three years out, and he did only the big football games. Whether, after the failure of this sally, Mr. Blockman would have perceived himself to be in a cynical atmosphere is problematical, for Gloria arrived. Muriel arrived, Rachel arrived. After a hurried hello, people, uttered by Gloria and echoed by the other two, the three swept by into the dressing room. A moment later Muriel appeared, in a state of elaborate undress, and crept toward them. She was in her element, her ebony hair was slicked straight back on her head, her eyes were artificially darkened, she reeked of insistent perfume. She was got up to the best of her ability as a siren, more popularly, a vamp, a picker-up and thrower-away of men, an unscrupulous and fundamentally unmoved toyer with affections. Something in the exhaustiveness of her attempt fascinated Maury at first sight, a woman with wide hips affecting a panther-like leafness. As they waited the extra three minutes for Gloria, and, by polite assumption, for Rachel, he was unable to take his eyes from her. She would turn her head away, lowering her eyelashes and biting her nether lip, in an amazing exhibition of coyness. She would rest her hands on her hips and sway from side to side in tune to the music, saying, Did you ever hear such perfect ragtime? I just can't make my shoulders behave when I hear that. Mr. Blockman clapped his hands gallantly. You ought to be on the stage. I'd like to be, cried Muriel. Will you back me? I sure will. With becoming modesty, Muriel ceased her motions and turned to Moray, asking what he had seen this year. He interpreted this as referring to the dramatic world, and they had a gay and exhilarating exchange of titles after this manner. Muriel, have you seen Pego My Heart? Maury, no, I haven't. Muriel, eagerly, it's wonderful, you want to see it. Maury, have you seen Omar the Tent Maker? Muriel, no, but I hear it's wonderful. I'm very anxious to see it. Have you seen Fair and Warmer? Maury, hopefully, yes. Muriel, I don't think it's very good. It's trashy. Maury, faintly. Yes, that's true. Muriel, but I went to Within the Law last night, and I thought it was fine. Have you seen The Little Café? This continued until they ran out of plays. Dick, meanwhile, turned to Mr. Blockman, determined to extract what gold he could from this unpromising load. I hear all the new novels are sold to the moving pictures as soon as they come out. That's true. Of course, the main thing in a moving picture is a strong story. Yes, I suppose so. So many novels are all full of talk and psychology. Of course, those aren't as valuable to us. It's impossible to make much of that interesting on the screen. You want plots first, said Richard brilliantly. Of course, plots first. He paused, shifted his gaze. His paws spread, included the others with all the authority of a warning finger. Gloria, followed by Rachel, was coming out of the dressing-room. Among other things, it developed during dinner that Joseph Blockman never danced, but spent the music time watching the others with the bored tolerance of an elder among children. He was a dignified man, and a proud one. Born in Munich, he had begun his American career as a peanut vendor with a traveling circus. At eighteen he was a sideshow ballyhoo, later the manager of the sideshow, and, soon after, the proprietor of a second-class vaudeville house. Just when the moving picture had passed out of the stage of a curiosity 
and become a promising industry, he was an ambitious young man of twenty-six with some money to invest, nagging financial ambitions, and a good working knowledge of the popular show business. That had been nine years before. The moving picture industry had borne him up with it where it threw off dozens of men with more financial ability, more imagination, and more practical ideas. And now he sat here and contemplated the immortal Gloria, for whom young Stuart Holcomb had gone from New York to Pasadena, watched her, and knew that presently she would cease dancing and come back to sit on his left hand. He hoped she would hurry. The oysters had been standing some minutes. Meanwhile Anthony, who had been placed on Gloria's left hand, was dancing with her, always in a certain fourth of the floor. This, had there been stags, would have been a delicate tribute to the girl, meaning, damn you, don't cut in. It was very consciously intimate. Well, he began, looking down at her, you look mighty sweet tonight. She met his eyes over the horizontal half-foot that separated them. Thank you, Anthony. In fact, you're uncomfortably beautiful, he added. There was no smile this time. And you're very charming. Isn't this nice, he laughed. We actually approve of each other. Don't you, usually? She had caught quickly at his remark, as she always did at any unexplained allusion to herself, however faint. He lowered his voice, and when he spoke there was in it no more than a wisp of badinage. Does a priest approve of the Pope? I don't know, but that's probably the vaguest compliment I ever received. Perhaps I can muster a few bromides. Well, I wouldn't have you strain yourself. Look, at Muriel, right here, next to us. He glanced over his shoulder. Muriel was resting her brilliant cheek against the lapel of Maury Noble's dinner coat, and her powdered left arm was apparently twisted around his head. One was impelled to wonder why she failed to seize the nape of his neck with her hand. Her eyes, turned ceilingward, rolled largely back and forth, her hips swayed, and as she danced she kept up a constant low singing. This at first seemed to be a translation of the song into some foreign tongue, but became eventually apparent as an attempt to fill out the meter of the song with the only words she knew, the words of the title. He's a rag-picker, a rag-picker, a rag-time-picking man, rag-picking, picking, pick-pick, rag-pick, pick-pick, and so on, into phrases still more strange and barbaric. When she caught the amused glances of Anthony and Gloria, she acknowledged them only with a faint smile and a half-closing of her eyes, to indicate that the music entering into her soul had put her into an ecstatic and exceedingly seductive trance. The music ended and they returned to their table, whose solitary but dignified occupant arose and tendered each of them a smile so ingratiating that it was as if he were shaking their hands and congratulating them on a brilliant performance. Blockhead never will dance. I think he has a wooden leg, remarked Gloria to the table at large. The three young men started, and the gentleman referred to winced perceptibly. This was the one rough spot in the course of Blockman's acquaintance with Gloria. She relentlessly punned on his name. First it had been Blockhouse, lately the more invidious Blockhead. He had requested with a strong undertone of irony that she use his first name, and this she had done obediently several times, then slipping, helpless, repentant, but dissolved in laughter, back into Blockhead. It was a very sad and thoughtless thing. "'I'm afraid Mr. Blockman thinks we're a frivolous crowd,' sighed Muriel, waving a balanced oyster in his direction. "'He has that air,' murmured Rachel. Anthony tried to remember whether she had said anything before. He thought not. It was her initial remark. Mr. Blockman suddenly cleared his throat and said in a loud, distinct voice, "'On the contrary, when a man speaks he's merely tradition. He has, at best, a few thousand years back of him. But woman, why, she's the miraculous mouthpiece of posterity.'" In the stunned pause that followed this astounding remark, Anthony choked suddenly on an oyster and hurried his napkin to his face. Rachel and Muriel raised a mild, if somewhat surprised, laugh, in which Dick and Maury joined both of them red in the face and restraining uproariousness with the most apparent difficulty. "'My God!' thought Anthony. "'It's a subtitle from one of his movies. The man's memorized it.' Gloria alone made no sound. She fixed Mr. Blockman with a glance of silent reproach. "'Well, for the love of heaven, where on earth did you dig that up?' Blockman looked at her uncertainly, not sure of her intention. 
but in a moment he recovered his poise and assumed the bland and consciously tolerant smile of an intellectual among spoiled and callow youth. The soup came up from the kitchen, but simultaneously the orchestra leader came up from the bar, where he had absorbed the tone color inherent in the sidel of beer. So the soup was left to cool during the delivery of a ballad entitled Everything's at Home Except Your Wife. Then the champagne, and the party assumed more amusing proportions. The men, except Richard Caramel, drank freely. Gloria and Muriel sipped a glass apiece, Rachel Gerald took none. They sat out the waltzes, but danced to everything else, all except Gloria, who seemed to tire after a while, and preferred to sit smoking at the table, her eyes now lazy, now eager, according to whether she listened to Blockman or watched a pretty woman among the dancers. Several times Anthony wondered what Blockman was telling her. He was chewing a cigar back and forth in his mouth, and had expanded after dinner to the extent of violent gestures. Ten o'clock found Gloria and Anthony beginning a dance. Just as they were out of earshot of the table, she said in a low voice, "'Dance over by the door. I want to go down to the drug store.' Obediently, Anthony guided her through the crowd, in the designated direction. In the hall she left him for a moment, to reappear with a cloak over her arm. "'I want some gumdrops,' she said, humorously apologetic. "'You can't guess what for this time. It's just that I want to bite my fingernails, and I will if I don't get some gumdrops.' She sighed and resumed as they stepped into the empty elevator. I've been biting them all day. A bit nervous, you see. Excuse the pun. It was unintentional. The words just arranged themselves. Gloria Gilbert, the female wag. Reaching the ground floor, they naively avoided the hotel candy counter, descended the wide front staircase, and, walking through several corridors, found a drug store in the Grand Central Station. After an intense examination of the perfume counter, she made her purchase. Then, on some mutual unmentioned impulse, they strolled, arm in arm, not in the direction from which they had come, but out into 43rd Street. The night was alive with thaw. It was so nearly warm that a breeze drifting low along the sidewalk brought to Anthony a vision of an unhoped-for hyacinthine spring. Above, in the blue oblong of sky, around them, in the caress of the drifting air, the illusion of a new season carried relief from the stiff and breathed-over atmosphere they had left, and for a hushed moment the traffic sounds and the murmur of water flowing in the gutters seemed an elusive and rarefied prolongation of that music to which they had lately danced. When Anthony spoke it was with surety that his words came from something breathless and desirous that the night had conceived in their two hearts. "'Let's take a taxi and ride around a bit,' he suggested, without looking at her. Oh, Gloria, Gloria! A cab yawned at the curb. As it moved off like a boat on a labyrinthine ocean and lost itself among the inchoate night masses of the great buildings, among the now stilled, now strident, cries and clangings, Anthony put his arm around the girl, drew her over to him, and kissed her damp, childish mouth. She was silent. She turned her face up to him, pale under the wisps and patches of light that trailed in like moonshine through a foliage. Her eyes were gleaming ripples in the white lake of her face. The shadows of her hair bordered the brow with a persuasive, unintimate dusk. No love was there, surely, nor the imprint of any love. Her beauty was cool as this damp breeze, as the moist softness of her own lips. "'You're such a swan in this light,' he whispered after a moment. There were silences as murmurous as sound. There were pauses that seemed about to shatter, and were only to be snatched back to oblivion by the tightening of his arms about her, and the sense that she was resting there as a caught gossamer feather, drifted in out of the dark. Anthony laughed, noiselessly and exultantly, turning his face up and away from her, half in an overpowering rush of triumph, half lest her sight of him should spoil the splendid immobility of her expression. Such a kiss, it was a flower held against the face, never to be described, scarcely to be remembered, as though her beauty were giving off emanations of itself which settled transiently and already dissolving upon his heart. The buildings fell away in melted shadows. This was the park now, and, after a long while, the great white ghost of the Metropolitan Museum moved majestically past, echoing sonorously to the rush of the cab. Why, Gloria! Why, Gloria! 
Her eyes appeared to regard him out of many thousand years. All emotion she might have felt, all words she might have uttered, would have seemed inadequate beside the adequacy of her silence, ineloquent against the eloquence of her beauty, and of her body, close to him, slender and cool. "'Tell him to turn around,' she murmured, "'and drive pretty fast going back.' Up in the supper-room the air was hot. The table, littered with napkins and ash-trays, was old and stale. It was between dances as they entered, and Muriel Kane looked up with roguishness extraordinary. "'Well, where have you been?' "'To call up mother,' answered Gloria coolly. "'I promised her I would. Did we miss a dance?' There followed an incident that, though slight in itself, Anthony had caused to reflect on many years afterward. Joseph Blockman, leaning well back in his chair, fixed him with a peculiar glance, in which several emotions were curiously and inextricably mingled. He did not greet Gloria except by rising, and he immediately resumed a conversation with Richard Caramel about the influence of literature on the moving pictures. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part One of Two